Hello, I'm Eric Pilgrim, and I'm with Fort Knox News. Today, I'll be joined by Captain Jenny Nocella. She is the aide de camp to the Commanding General of Human Resources Command, and we are going to talk more personally about, uh, about a directive that had just come out today from the U.S. Army regarding pregnancy and postpartum issues. In February 2021, a white paper was submitted from the field that outlined the five most prominent barriers that pregnant and postpartum women face. The Army established a manpower and reserve affairs led working group to review the problems and solutions identified in the white paper. The working group modified the white paper's recommendations, included additional ongoing people first initiatives, and eventually aggregated 12 distinct policy recommendations into a single Army directive. This working group first met in March 2021 and has been working with stakeholders on drafting the Army directive ever since. These policy recommendations were briefed at every level of the Army People Strategy governance process to all senior leaders. Guidance from these forums has been integrated into the new Army Directive. Welcome, Jenny. Tell us about the Army's new Pregnancy, Postpartum, and, and Parenthood Directive. Well, first of all, thank you so much for um, bringing me here. I'm really excited to talk about this directive. We've put quite a bit of time uh, into working through this directive, and uh, I think the biggest takeaway for me is that it gives a name to parenthood in the Army for all parents, not just for mothers, but for fathers, for mothers, for, for everyone. Um, and I think it really um, continues to support the people first strategy that we're moving toward for our Army. So it gives a lot of flexibility um, to commanders uh, and it gives them a lot more tools in their toolbox to be able to really genuinely take care of not only each other, but to take care of their soldiers and to take care of everyone that's in their organization. So what was your role in the Army Directive? So lucky for me, uh, I have a phenomenal friend who did a lot of the real footwork in this directive. Um, and she uh, reached out to me a few months ago and asked me if I would be willing to provide some perspective from one, my job, but two, from my time as an HR professional um, in the Army, since that's what I've done my entire career. And so I offered to help, you know, thinking it would be a, a small project. Unbeknownst to me, it was actually quite a large project. Um, and I've had a really great time um, helping the team work through some of uh, what those operational requirements would be and how we capture both the the combat arms side of the Army and how we maintain readiness in the Army and how we also take care of families simultaneously. Okay, um, I'm assuming that there's probably a personal side to this. So tell us a little bit about your, the, kind of your personal reasons for being involved in this, in this group. Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, personally, I'm a single mom. I have a seven-year-old daughter uh, and I have been a single mom the majority of my time in the Army. And for me, it, it won't necessarily impact me now. You know, I'm, I don't plan on having any more kids. I love mine and she's more than enough for me. Uh, but that's not the case for everybody. That's not the case for leaders above me, for my peers who serve with me, and for the soldiers that I will be lucky enough to serve with in the future. Uh, and I think for them, this is a resource that will better their careers. And I think it will improve that drive for people to want to continue to stay in the Army um, because the Army is working toward that people first initiative and taking care of soldiers and putting soldiers and their families first. Now I understand there's a lot to this directive. There's, it's, it's pretty heavy with, with a lot of information, good information. Um, from, the, from the working group that you worked with, what would you say jumped out at you or some, some directives maybe um, that, that you feel kind of personally touched you or you feel, you feel good about what came out of it? So. I don't know if I can pick just a few, but one that, that really hits home for me is the changes in family care plans. So, of course, as a single mom for me, uh, there have been times where I've had to take my daughter to my mom who, you know, lived a few hours away from me and been like, okay, mom, you're in charge. Um, here's, here's my daughter. Don't do anything bad. Um, because, you know, we did have a short notice field exercise or some other event that we had to go to, whether that be, you know, TDY or deployments or wherever that may be. And in this directive, there is additional guidance that is provided to leaders, um, particularly to commanders, on what you do and do not use a family care plan for. Um, 
you know, one of the big things that we hear a lot is, oh, I just got notified that I'm gonna have to go to the field in three days and they want me to activate my family care plan. Uh, and now this directive addresses that and, you know, there is lead time to how much notification you have to give a service member and their family um, for a family care plan. And I think the second one is the ability to stabilize individuals from uh, deployments. So before, you know, you could stabilize a mother um, with a child, but now you have the ability, um, if the child is, I think it's up to a year of age, that either individual can apply for that deferment to be able to stay with that child, whether that's the mother or the father, but we put that in the family's hands to make that decision because that is a family decision on what's best for them. Now on the, the postpartum side, um, there is kind of a stigma, there has been at least in the past sort of a stigma with, uh, with uh, people suffering from postpartum. H how is that directive uh, tackling that or going after that? Absolutely, so I, I think you know in the Army there is a lot of drive toward readiness and I think sometimes when we talk about readiness we don't talk about what the effect is on families that drives readiness. So, you know, if soldiers are, we see it all the time, if soldiers are having trouble at home or they're having trouble at work, that maybe they don't talk about those struggles that they're going through. So, you know, one of the, the cool initiatives that comes out of this directive is if there is a loss of a child that both the mother and the father um, can receive leave for that and time to grieve the loss of that child. And I think for a long time, there has been a stigma about single male parents in particular, and I don't know if it's necessarily a stigma, if it's something that we just don't talk about. Um, you know, when you think of parents in the Army, a lot of times I think people think about mothers. They don't think about fathers and what goes along with being a father in the Army, whether that's, you know, a mother and a father of a child, or if it's a single parent of a child, who's facing those same struggles every day. Um, you know, we have a lot of updates to the family care plan portion of this directive as well um, that will give commanders a little more left and right limits on what, what they use family care plans for. Um, and I think that will benefit both single mothers, single fathers who really are genuinely struggling right now between deciding, do I stay in the Army or do I do what's best for my family? Because I think in some instances they don't get the best of both worlds. Now, uh, fertility issues. There, there are fertility issues that, that are addressed in this directive as well. Is that right? There is, absolutely. So one of the things that is addressed in this directive is that when a soldier, whether they are an active duty service member or the spouse of a service member, um, is going through fertility treatment, that that individual can be stabilized. So either the person who's in treatment uh, and also their spouse. So, you know, say that my spouse is receiving treatment up to a year, they can be stabilized through the duration of that treatment. Now, uh, complications in pregnancy itself, uh, are, there, are there issues that are, that are um, addressed in this directive as well regarding that or, or any other issues with pregnancy? There are, so I don't know if you can necessarily call it complications, but, you know, naturally um, when you carry a child, you know, you gain weight, your size changes, you know, your, your body type changes. Uh, and sometimes, you know, maybe your uniform doesn't fit as well as it fit before. Um, you know, maybe it takes you a little longer to lose that weight that you put on, um, you know, when you were pregnant. And I think for us, part of the problem for a lot of female service members was that they were being disadvantaged for promotions and attending boards because they couldn't get back in their uniforms fast enough. Um, and I think one of the cool things that comes out of this directive is that they're giving a little more leeway to those women to lose weight in a manner that is healthy for them and for them to continue to be able to take care of their children the way that they should be, right? So for a lot of mothers who are breastfeeding, they have to almost decide right now, am I gonna continue to breastfeed or am I gonna do a crash diet to fit in my uniform because I wanna be able to go to the board to get promoted. Um, and I think this directive really gets after some of those struggles for women when it comes to, you know, do I have to buy, do I have to go and spend, you know, another four or five hundred dollars to get a new uniform because I can't fit in mine and I want to go to the board and I want to get promoted, but I can't because I can't get in my uniform. Mm. Um, and I think that is, you know, for, for young soldiers, that's a lot of money. 
And that's a lot that could go toward their family and their home, and they're losing out on that because they want to get promoted and they, and they want to continue to serve in the Army. And, and they want to re-enlist and they want to continue to contribute to what the Army is for, for this nation, but they're put in a place where they have to decide one or the other. Now this directive obviously extends beyond just pregnancy and postpartum, right? It even goes into parenthood itself. So what were some of the, uh, some of the recommendations that your, your group came up with and some ideas regarding parenthood? You know, everyone thinks moms. They don't think parents. Um, and when we, we, we went through this directive, some of the things that we really struggled with, you know, we've already spoken about it too, was about, you know, when, they, when someone loses a child or when you're looking at family care plan concerns, um, you know, everyone wants to look at moms. They don't look at parents as a whole. Um, and as one unit. Um, you know, in the, the Facebook group that we have that I'm very, very fortunate for because it gives me a perspective that I probably wouldn't have otherwise because my daughter is much older um, than the moms that, you know, are, are having brand new babies these days. And I'm, I'm very excited for all of them that they're gonna get the chance to see this directive really come to fruition and they're gonna be able to benefit from it. Um, instead of feeling like, you know, they're stuck and they don't have any other options. So deletions, deferments, um, changes in assignments are all things that are all brought up in this directive as well um, to support, you know, not only unit readiness, but family readiness um, for all families. Now, can you give us some examples of, of some of those changes uh, for, for unit readiness for families, uh, for, for the soldiers and the units that they're in? So previously for soldiers, you could, uh, you know, and, and my friends and I are a great example, right? My daughter was a few months old when I deployed. Um, and the same for many of my friends, you know, four, five, six months old, and we were all getting on a plane. And for soldiers now, uh, you can't be separated from your child for up to 12 months. And, you know, that period of time especially is very important for a child's growth, not only for, um, you know, for breastfeeding parents, or but for any parents, being with your child the first year of their life, and you know, watching them learn how to crawl, watching them learn how to eat, you know, watching them learn how to do all of those, you know, cool once in a lifetime moments for them. Um, I think parents were really missing out on before. Where can soldiers go to learn more about about this directive and these decisions? So thankfully, the Army's social media campaign is very far reaching. Um, so they could probably find updates on this on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on any organizational unit page. Um, they could go to any of the publications, um, army.mil websites to be able to find it. The HRC homepage will have something for it. Um, you know, I'm sure at this point when this directive comes out that they could probably just search postpartum army directive and I bet they would be able to find it. So, so what is your message to leaders and soldiers about this new directive? I think the biggest takeaway from this directive is that we have to educate everyone in the force on what comes next for soldiers. Um, especially when for so long they've been put in a position where they need to choose basically between serving or having a family. Um, and educating everybody, educate your, you know, do LPDs, get out there and, and talk to your soldiers that want families. Uh, and maybe necessarily it's not, you know, yay, my wife's pregnant, but maybe it's, you know, hey, we have had fertility issues or we have lost a child before. And, and really getting, at, getting in and reading the directive and understanding what you can and cannot do for your soldiers and, and taking that tool and, and weaponizing it and using it to do the right things by your soldiers and to really take care of them uh, because they deserve it. And, it. and it's not just soldiers at, you know, the, at the lower levels, it's every soldier. It's every NCO, it's every warrant officer, it's, every, it's everyone. You know, we have a lot of women who, you know, are in the senior officer ranks who waited a very long time to have kids because that's where it fit in, in their career path. And, you know, giving them the tools to take care of their soldiers that maybe they didn't have um, when they were younger, I think is, is my biggest takeaway is just be better. Be better than the leaders that you had before you because you know, they may have been phenomenal and they may have been great, but now the Army is giving you more policies to be even better. 
So I'm sure working with people uh, within this working group, there were, there were some things that happened. What were some of the things that, that kind of surprised you coming out of the working group? I think the biggest surprise for me was how many people were genuinely willing to take their own personal time and effort to really drive towards a huge change for parents in the Army. Uh, you know, for a long time, you, 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 you see so many people, but you don't necessarily believe that, you know, hey, maybe if I went and asked them, they'd be willing to take all their time on the weekends and after work to, you know, sift through what policies we do have, what changes we should make, how we impact that change, how we implement that change. Um, and just to see this group of people take so much of their time um, out of their days, out of their families' lives, out of their own lives to really drive towards that change, I think, was the most surprising um, and, and exciting part for me. Uh, because, you know, you don't necessarily see that behind the scenes work all the time. Uh, and for something, you know, that's so near and dear to my heart, um, to really come to fruition from all these people really putting in all that effort, I think, was the best part. Okay, as an adjutant general officer, uh, professional, and, uh, and one and a member of the uh, HRC community, what, how do you see this this directive uh, working for uh, personnel clerks and, and for officers who are in charge of personnel offices? So we have a lot of tools at our disposal at Human Resources Command to take care of every service member, but I think this directive gives us additional tools when it comes to uh, individuals who are in fertility treatment. So if you have either a service member who is in fertility treatment or say you have the spouse of a service member who is in fertility treatment, um, it allows us now to stabilize that family and those individuals so that they can continue on that journey without the concern of, I'm gonna have to move to a new location or I'm gonna have to move and my family is gonna have to stay um, after you know we've spent X amount of dollars um, you know, we've, had, we've heard some cases where people have spent upwards of $40,000 for fertility treatment, and then they may come down on an assignment. And, you know, in the environment we're in now, we may not have necessarily had the tool to prevent that from happening, uh, but we do have that now that this directive has come out, and it has given us and the career managers additional tools to, to put people first, which is what, you know, the big push is from big army is to put people first. And that gives our career managers and all the people who work so diligently in this building to take care of everybody an additional tool in their toolkit to be able to do that.